They say it's all about the journey. So we're biking across northwestern China's remote grasslands to learn the true story of China's Tibetan Buddhists. We're on a mission to find out what life is like for them. They live on these cold, harsh plains, but things can heat up in an instant. And we're finding out the hard way just what that means. The riots broke out in Lhasa, in Shaha, and all over the region. The government put us on a plane and sent us out of town. I'm Jeff Hutchins, and I'm a photographer. I'm Peter Hutchins, and I'm a filmmaker. We grew up in China, and now we're going back to capture China in its moment of change. And there's only one way to do that, to get lost. All right, Pete, you beat Greg Lamond. I'll be Lance Armstrong. I'm sure these are the same kind of bikes they use in the Tour de France. <laughs> Hey, Jeff, check that out. We got a game going on. You want to play a little pickup basketball? Sure. We've come this far. <laughs> Who would ever expect to find a bunch of Tibetan herders playing hoops in the hinterlands of northwestern China? Ah, uh, cool. Hey, we can play a game, right? Yeah. I wonder what the rules of Tibetan pickup b-ball are. Could you say You guys are in good shape. I don't think I can keep up. It's not helping that we're about 3,000 meters above sea level. Oh, nice! <laughs> Maybe we should take a break and find out a little more about these guys. It's <laughs> a young. Wonder how long they've been playing ball. Oh, about two years. So what kind of work do you do? So they're all herdsmen here. Okay. So they used to be nomadic, but now they live in this area. Do you guys prefer living in your old homes or your new homes better? So they like living at the old places better. So since these guys have moved here in the last two years, you know, they have TV, they have electricity in their houses, and that's actually, I think, probably where basketball became a bit popular, than watching Yao Ming play on TV. It's like they went to sleep in the 19th century and woke up in the 21st. But the place we're heading for is ancient and likes it that way. Unfortunately, so are these bikes. <laughs> Did your bike break again? Yeah. The whole, uh, uh, you were kidding me. No, look at the chain guard. Man, you'd think that in a country of a billion bikes, they'd learn how to make one that doesn't break. You know, they only put this road here like two years ago. Before, it would have just been straight shot over these hills and stuff. It would have been even bumpier of a ride. For a few centuries, this stretch of land in northwestern China's Gansu province was part of the Silk Road that linked China with the West. And it didn't only carry silk and spices. Cultural and religious ideas came through here too. Among other things, the Silk Road brought Buddhism from India to China. Pretty uh, cool part of the country. It is. Yeah, this doesn't look anything like back east in China. No. Sure doesn't. Far cry from Beijing, that's for sure. The town of Xiaohe in Gansu province is known as Little Tibet. Since the Chinese invasion of Tibet and the exile of the Dalai Lama in the 1950s, many Tibetans have fled to this part of China. We're about to meet up with our guide, Sunam, who will translate the Tibetan for us. Hi. Hey, Sunam, how Hi. are you? Hey, Hi. how's it going? How's the ride? Oh, it's great. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, we're just so excited to look around here. This place looks like it's been around forever. This is a great place to experience the ancient Tibetan traditions. 
At the moment, the monks can practice here in relative peace. But it hasn't always been that way. This is Lebrang Monastery, sometimes called Labulum. And it survived almost 300 years of ethnic wars, rebellion, political change, and social upheaval. It's a testament to the faith of China's five million Tibetans, who are mostly Buddhists. Watching the pilgrims and monks here, I feel like I've wandered back to a different time and place. I'm struck by the sheer number of pilgrims and the lack of tourists. Where are all these pilgrims from? Oh, here mostly some are from local peoples, uh -huh. and some are from the Qinghai, okay. and some are from Sichuan. Why have they come here? Sure, blessing, and so everybody comes here to worship, yeah, or get blessed, blessed, yeah. Lebrang is the largest monastery outside the Tibetan Autonomous Region, the dominant Tibetan Buddhist sect, the Yellow Hat Buddhists. Yellow is the Buddhist color of the earth, which symbolizes discipline and the foundation of all good things. The Yellow Hat sect was founded in the early 14th century, they begin the tradition of living lamas that continues with their current spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama. Since the Dalai Lama was exiled, he's been a vocal advocate for Tibetan rights. At the moment, his followers and the government share a shaky truce. I think that one reason these monks treasure their religious freedom is that to them, Buddhism is more than an ancient religion. It's something they live and breathe every day. These monks are in the midst of a debate. What kind of things do they debate? The debate, it's all about the philosophy. Sanam tells us that the clapping emphasizes different interpretations of the Dharma. The Dharma is the teachings of Buddhism but it also refers to the everyday experiences that make the teachings come alive. That's why Buddhists call it the living dharma. Then we see another interesting practice. What are they doing with the rice, with the rice there? Yeah. Sunam explains that a monk first meditates on the empty bowl, which represents the empty nature of all things. Then he places mounds of rice in the bowl to create the cosmos from nothingness. Finally, he offers it up as a step toward enlightenment. Uh, it's an offering for the gods and the high lamas are there, sitting up there. Okay, so it's, it's really to, uh, to, for a blessing for the monastery. Yeah, yeah, okay. sure, sure. We're impressed by the devotion of the pilgrims. As they pray, they touch their whole bodies to the ground three times. Each prostration expresses their dedication to Buddhism's three jewels the Buddha, the Dharma or teachings, and the Sangha or community. Each prostration also symbolizes discarding the three poisons, hatred, ignorance, and excess. The pilgrimage goes to Lhasa by prostrating the really? whole way, yeah. And sometimes they will die on our way. It's about 1,200 kilometers to Lhasa, the capital of the so-called Tibetan Autonomous Region. But many of these ethnic Tibetans will never see their homeland. Once, as many as 4,000 monks lived here, but during the Cultural Revolution, their numbers dwindled. How many monks are at this, uh, at Labolong At the moment? Yeah. Uh, at the moment, uh, according to the registration, this is somewhere 1,500 to 600. Okay. Yeah, but ones who are not registered, if you included them, then it goes to more than 2,000. But would he be from this monastery or would yeah. he be from another monastery? No, this monastery. Okay. Yeah, I can see from the way of their dress. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Dressing. 
And what, what, is, what kind of dress does this monastery have particularly? The Tibetan monks have worn maroon and yellow robes, called donkas, since the 14th century. The shoulders are modeled after the mane of a lion because the king of beasts has no fear. So he remains relaxed and peaceful. But the peaceful atmosphere here could come under fire again soon. We want to make the most of it, but you always have to be a little wary at LeBron. LeBron means the place where the Buddhist palace stands. It's a place for prayer and study, with six colleges, a large library of Tibetan sutras, and also an art museum. And this is an icon of LeBron the Grand Gold Tile Hall, one of the monastery's largest buildings. Wow, this looks timeless in here. This has such a, a cool kind of musty, ancient in a lot of ways smell in here. It's exactly what you'd expect from you know, this kind of temple. Yeah, I think a lot of it actually is coming from those yak butter candles. They just have that really distinct smell to them. Yeah, but then there's all the fluorescent lights now. I mean, other than that, this place looks like it could be 200 years ago. Is it okay if we shoot some? Actually, it's not allowed here, but you have a permission, so. <laughs> wow, so yeah. we're the first ones. It's a rare the chance, you know. Yeah. Nobody can get a chance to take photo here. We're the first Western media allowed to film inside this temple, which may be a sign of the government's recent tolerance. But lately, we've heard buzz that things are changing. All we can do now is enjoy this while we can. And there's, um Around the candles, there's money mm -hmm. and incense. What, what are those used for? The monies are all donations from the pilgrimage. Yeah, and incense, you know, the, when they donate, they can get some incense from here and they can burn it to pray. This is such a unique opportunity. It's hard to stop shooting. But something outside catches our ear. Stunning. You can imagine them doing this here in the same kind of courtyard for the last several hundred years. Sonam, can you ask them, what's the purpose of the music? The meaning of the music for the lamas, you know, it's uh, like uh, to welcome for the high lamas and also offering to the God. So it's a, it's a greeting for the lamas as well as kind of a, a prayer offering. Gods and also to welcome high lamas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was beautiful. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that's really stunning to listen yeah. to that. Pilgrims pray pretty much as they have for centuries. Watching them walk the one and a half kilometer Kora, the pilgrimage path, you really get a sense of their dedication. There are more than a thousand prayer wheels, and each spin is said to send a scripture toward heaven. But Tsunam tells us that there's another group of Tibetan Buddhists who have a temple nearby, the Red Hat Sect. I hear they have some surprisingly different customs. The Red Sect was founded in the 8th century. 
It's the oldest of the Tibetan Buddhist sects. This distinctive sound is called throat singing. It was inspired by the roar of a lion. Tibetan Buddhist chant masters use it to lead prayer ceremonies. The chanting is said to purify the heart and calm the soul. Some of the chants have been passed down from generation to generation for thousands of years. They're so engrossed in their worship that they hardly seem to notice us, even when we're filming them. Sanam tells us the papers the monks read from are actually the pilgrims' prayers. All of the sounds that I associate with Buddhism, the bells, gongs, drums, and chanting, they all have such a mysterious and serene quality here. But I'm wondering about the meaning of what we've heard, and Sunam has some friends who can tell us. Prayers that they were doing today, what are, what are those about? Today, that's the ceremonies for the pilgrimage and the other people, which you saw those papers. They have written whatever they have a disease or some like evil things happening, you know, so they just give the money inside and they pray for them okay. to destroy those evil. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The religious music and the colorful traditional clothing make it seem like the rest of the world doesn't exist here. You can see why these Tibetan Buddhists are so determined to hold on to their religion and culture. That was absolutely incredible there. The way their voices are just so resonant and guttural, it's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. And it just, you know, it's such a sound. Well, what struck me is that you've got all ages in there. You have, you have kids who might be six years old, and then you have old men, you know, and they're all chanting together. It was just how cool to see them all keeping time with the drums. And, yeah. Wow, yeah. That's stunning. What, what an experience. Away from the brilliant colors of the monastery, I'm struck by how monochromatic the winter landscape is. It's awe-inspiring. It feels endless and absolutely unforgiving. It's such a cool landscape. You know, China has so many different types of landscapes, and Gansu as well, I think, has it's about everything from desert to the mountains. Like China's ethnic diversity, with 56 different groups, I'm impressed that one nation can contain so much geographic diversity. We're wondering how well the different groups coexist. So we're heading for an ancient fort town in the foothills of the White Mountains that may hold a clue. This is Ba Jiaocheng, which means octagonal city. It's the only ancient Chinese village that's octagonal, so it has a special place in world architecture. It has 2,000 years old. It was built in Han Dynasty. Ba Jiaocheng is located at a pass that linked Han Chinese territories to Mongolian ones. So this place was initially built to protect the Han Chinese from, from the Mongolians about 2,000 years ago. Yeah. Then after the Tibetan people came here, you know, maybe 300 years ago, Today, there's conflict between the dominant Han Chinese ethnic group and the Tibetan minority. Many Tibetans feel they've been left behind by the economic boom in other parts of China. And many resent China's occupation of their Tibetan homeland. And are these guys all, uh, are they pretty much all farmers? Yeah. And the kids that, that are walking around through the neighborhood, what, what do you think their life will be like? Will they go to school and then leave the village, or will they leave the village and come back? The kids, you know, when they go to study, they like to come back, you know, when they graduate, whatever. But now it's different, you know. They want to go in the big towns like that. I asked Sunam how important education is considered here. 
it's the main important, you know, education now, uh -huh. not like before. Before the religious important now, you have to learn. Without education, you can't survive your family, and also you can't catch up with others, you know. Right. You are always be a, what they call <laughs> uneducated. So, how recently would you say that's a change? Has that been in the last? Yeah. Last 10 years. Oh, really? That recently? Really? Yeah. Wow. Wow. So how many families live in, in this area? Somewhere 100 families. 100 families. And so they, their families have been living here continuously for roughly the last 300 years? Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. Seeing the farm families with their homes and animals, it seems like life here is pretty much the same as it was 300 years ago. Then I spot a clue to the changes here. I can't believe we're in a 2,000-year-old fort, and yet you've got power lines and even solar panels on some of these. And some of the houses look new, too. Yeah. You know, they're building it up. Do you see the satellite dish? Yeah, that's an interesting contrast with the uh, adobe walls here. Wow. The strange thing is this place actually reminds me more of the American Southwest than, than anything else. I mean, you have the mountains in the background, the whole color of the landscape, and then these walls, like the, the clay mud walls, it's sort of like adobe. How do they construct these walls? I guess it's the clay, met, clay mud, but then what is the smoother part? It's the uh, cow dung. Oh, sorry, the yak dung. Yak dung? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they use yak dung for everything then? Yeah. For making fires and, and, uh, and then they, they milk the yaks, they make cheese, yak they eat butter. Them. You eat the yaks. I mean, that's that great, great uh, sort of beef jerky yeah. thing that we had. Oh, yeah, I love it. and even in the monasteries, they have the yak butter lamps. Yeah. So they, they really get some use out of yaks. I suppose you have to be pretty resourceful in general to live out in this kind of environment. I mean, this is not an easy place to live, it seems like. You know, I just know every time the cold wind whips through here, <laughs> it makes me thankful for home. Westerners like us might feel the urge to tame this wild place, but the Buddhists believe in harmony with nature, not dominance over it. That makes us curious about an animistic faith practiced locally that predates Buddhism, the Bun religion. Bun has especially strong ties to the natural world. And out here, so do we. Here comes some sheep, check this out. Ha! Right up by the road. We're biking over to visit a nearby Bun Monastery. <laughs> They're helping oh, us out with the bikes. This is great. I know, I need some <laughs> Wow. Check that out, Jeff. Yeah, that place is pretty impressive. The light is beautiful. Hey, hey, it's mine! <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. See how the wind is kicking up those flags too? Yeah, are our flags up top there? Yeah. It's pretty wild, it's all of them have script on them. We're not sure what the script says, since our Tibetan translator, Sunam, had to leave for another assignment. But hopefully some of the Tibetans here speak Mandarin. This monastery was first built about a thousand years ago, but not much of the original remains. That's because this Bun Monastery shared the same fate as many Buddhist monasteries under the officially atheist communist government. And this one was all but destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. I mean, it wasn't even until 1982 when they built it back up. It looks so much newer than the others. Yeah, it does. It actually, to me, it looks newer than 1982. The prayer wheels here remind us of the Korra Walk at the Lebrong Monastery except for one thing. You know, the Ben sect is the only group in Tibetan Buddhism that walk counterclockwise around the prayer wheels. Pretty interesting. Yeah. For the Bun, walking counterclockwise represents eternity and constancy. Bun is considered the indigenous religion of Tibet. When Buddhism first became popular here in the seventh century, there was conflict between the two religions. But over time, in the interest of survival, the Bun followers absorbed some of the Buddhist concepts. They also kept Bun practices, which gave them a feeling of control over their unpredictable environment. 
So far, I'm glad to see that the Tibetan Buddhists seem to be enjoying a time of peace here in Little Tibet. Yeah, when we were first coming out here, you don't really know what to expect. Is Tibetan culture and religious life and everything going to look like what you imagine it is or what it was 50 or 100 or several hundred years ago, or is it all going to be changed? And I've been really impressed to see how much of the culture um, seems like the Tibetan people are holding on to. Walking through some of the monasteries and seeing how real so much of it is, is it's pretty cool and pretty surprising. It's kind of funny, I, sound, I, I feel extremely cheesy saying it, but it does make you feel, you know, feel that there's something here that's different from other places in the world. Just as we're thinking about how peaceful it is, suddenly everything changes. Protests ignite in several Tibetan communities, including the Labrang Monastery, where we just were. As Western journalists, just a few days ago, we had special filming privileges. Not anymore. And the situation quickly escalates. Everything was going great in Shaha, and then riots broke out in Lhasa, in Shaha, and in cities all over the region. So. Next thing you know, we're on a plane out of there. We literally got kicked out of Gansu, so we got as far away as we could. We're about 1,500 kilometers south of Xiaohe, in Xishuangbana, in southern Yunnan province. We're in the tropics near the border with Thailand and Laos. The temperature's hotter here, but the politics are cooler. Life seems a lot more relaxed in this region, and frankly, we need to decompress. We're doing a series about change in China, and yet when the, when the demonstrations broke out in Lhasa and in Xiaohe, we found out that there are some things in China that just don't seem to change. I mean, the, the feel of that with the police coming in in riot gear and the soldiers marching in cadence, it really had the feel of Tiananmen Square or something like that. These are the biggest demonstrations since 1989. Suddenly you're back 20-something years and, and the government just shuts you down. No, no questions asked. When we saw those troops and the police coming in to the town in full riot gear, just con those convoys rolling into town, I knew, and I'm sure, you know, we both knew that if we picked up our cameras and tried to shoot anything of that, we would be gone. Yeah, and not just out of yeah. Gansu, out of the country. China just has this ability to say, you know what, everything's getting too intense. Get out of here. Well, now that we've gotten kicked out of there, it... You know, it's kind of like, where do you go? But this, I, this is a pretty logical place to come because we can still see how Buddhism interacts with people's everyday life. And, you know, down here it's a different kind of Buddhism. It's uh, Hinayana Buddhism. We've gotten to see the impact of Tibetan Buddhism on the daily life of Tibetans in Gansu. And now we get to come to a completely different part of China. We're in Xishuangbana, where the, the climate is much more temperate. And I imagine the, the Buddhism, the Hinayana Buddhism, is going to be a lot different than what we saw in Tibet. The term Hinayana means lesser vehicle and is insulting to many believers. But it's also what the local monks here call themselves. This area of China's southern Yunnan province is known as the Xishuangbana Dai Autonomous Prefecture. It's the home of the Dai people, as well as 12 other ethnic groups. It's also home to China's only rainforest, which stretches over more than 2,000 square kilometers. We're curious about whether the Hinayana, or Theravada as they're more commonly known, are as tied to the environment as the Tibetans are. To start our journey, our guide takes us to an area of the forest that's popular with families and local wildlife. Our guide's name is Li, but he speaks so fast in both Chinese and English that we've nicknamed him quickly. Oh, this is the monkey. Oh, it's every morning the monkey come to here, eat the food here. That's cool. What do they feed them? Peanuts and the corn. Peanuts and corn. Oh, Did you see that one swimming? I didn't know monkeys actually swim. <laughs> All they do is sit around, 
pick bugs out of each other's fur, eat. These guys go swimming. Yeah. That's exactly what I want to do for the rest of my life. Yeah. It's fun too. I mean, they look like everything they're doing, they, they're getting just from point A to point B, but it looks like they're having fun at it. Yeah. Jeff and I have been all over China, but this is our first time in a rainforest. I have to say, it's pretty cool. So quickly, why do you like to come out here? Okay, so the rainforest is like the lungs of the world. So you got to protect it. That makes sense. And do other people in Xishuang Bana think it's as important as you do? Yeah, most of the Dai people in Xishuang Bana, uh, no rainforest, no water, no water, no Dai minority. Oh, really? So without the forest, you wouldn't have water or the Dai people. And the Dai are Buddhists, so. You know, Buddhists are all about communing with nature. I guess it makes sense they want to protect the rainforest. But Quickly says they're losing ground to corporations that are buying up the rainforests and chopping them down to plant crops. Quickly, how long has this all been a banana plantation? About three years ago. Before here, lot of this area is a rainforest. Huh. So it's pretty much the rubber and banana plantations and some of the rice fields that are taking over that old rainforest land. Population growth and increasing prosperity are driving up the demand for food and other agricultural products. So in the past 30 years, southern Yunnan's rainforest has been cut by more than half. At the edge of the rainforest, traditional family farms are feeling the pressure too. Corporations are buying up the small, sustainable farms that have been in families for generations. They grow mushrooms and wild vegetables. They even grow flowers, roses, carnations, and chrysanthemums. For now, some farmers resist the temptation of newfound prosperity to keep their older traditions alive. And China has looked like this for the last 50 years out in the provinces. Yeah. Reminds me of growing up in Guangzhou when we were kids. Much remains the same, like the way the locals commute. It's quick, economical, and no greenhouse gases. So this is not the end of the line then, apparently. We can just cross over here on the boat? Yeah, take care. <laughs> it's nice, pretty undeveloped back here, huh? Yeah, it's very quiet. Yeah. So does this guy do this all day long, just ferry people back and forth from the fields back into their homes? Yeah, every day. Oh, pretty efficient way to get across. Yeah. Yo, yeah watch out, the boat is okay, well, super dala. slippery. Woman, dala. Okay, one by one. But we can literally see change on the horizon. Looks like Jinghong's developing pretty quickly over there, huh? Yeah. It's been an awesome couple of days in the farmlands and rainforests of Xishuangbana. We take a moment with Quick Lee to reflect on what we've seen. Yeah, thank you. Mm. It's nice to drink some cold water, huh? Yeah, <laughs> nice cold water. Because where is it very hot? Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a rainforest area down here. You can tell it's so humid. But it's nice. I've loved walking through the forest yesterday and you know just biking around today. It's been really, really cool. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> yeah. We're sorry to leave Quick Lee in the natural beauty of the rainforest. But we want to meet some local Buddhists and see how they fit into the landscape. Surprisingly, we find them in the bustling capital city of Jinghong. It's not far from the forest, but it feels a world away. These monks are bussed in every morning from a nearby monastery to collect alms. This couldn't be more different from the secluded monastic life of the Tibetan monks. The cool thing about this is in Western culture, so much of gift giving is done anonymously, but here this is extremely personal. The symbolism is that the monks seek food to nourish their wisdom. It's important for them to ask from both rich and poor, 
so they have an equal opportunity to give blessings. It also encourages more lay people to be charitable. We want to capture these monks in their modern urban environment, as we did with the Tibetans at their ancient monasteries. To find out more about the differences, we visit the Southern Theravada Cultural Center, a huge new monastery. One thing we know is that Buddhism was introduced into the Dai areas more than a thousand years ago. This place is really impressive. Yes, it is. Yeah, I'm pretty curious to see how it compares to Tibetan Buddhism. As soon as we enter the temple, the external differences between the Theravada and Tibetan faiths are obvious. This altar is a lot brighter and more open than the ones at the Lebrong Monastery. And the chanting is so much lighter than the deep Tibetan throat singing. The religious art is different too. Some of the Tibetan deities seem pretty ferocious. These deities look a little more peaceful. Even the saffron robes and pastel colors contrast with the Tibetans' deep reds and yellows. Here in Yunnan, the attitude is more laid back. But our big question is why the Theravada faith doesn't seem to threaten the government, while Tibetan Buddhism does. Our search for answers takes us to a smaller, older temple in the village of Meng Yangguan. Man, this place looks really authentic. Look at some of these beams. Yeah. It's a whole different style of Buddhism down here, you know? Is that a, um, it's a Tibetan monk, though? Looks like it. Is it? Yeah. He's not in the saffron road. Like, he's got the... Right. The yellow and the red. Yeah, that's true. Most of the guys down here have the saffron. You think he actually is from Tibet? I'm not sure. I don't know why he'd be down here. That would be crazy lucky for us if he is. I'd love to talk to him. Should we see? Yeah. Uh, sure, for. Uh, uh, ni hao. Ni hao. Uh, we can ask you a question. Can. Ah, you sure Nali Daran? So he's, he's from Sichuan. Right? Oh, man. And Sichuan's where a lot of this stuff is happening right now. Yeah, there's actually a big monastery there, a yeah, big yeah. Tibetan Buddhist monastery. Oh, so he must be Tibetan Buddhist, yeah. Monastery. A number of Tibetan monks have been killed in Sichuan recently by Chinese government troops during anti-government protests. It turns out that the monk is Tibetan. His name is Ishi Zhe Wu. We ask him to tell us more about the different philosophies of the Theravada and Tibetan faiths. He invites us to a Theravada religious festival tomorrow, so we can see for ourselves. But for now, the monk suggests we visit a local tea plantation. And as many times as we've been to China, this will be the first time we've ever seen how tea is grown. You know, like one of the animist uh, villages in this area. Oh, check out this gate. This is pretty cool. This is a Hani village, I think, right? So, and, and they're mostly animus. Yeah. yeah. I guess there's a meaning behind all the different parts of the gate. Like you've got the seven layers of heaven up top, and then... Uh, I'm just looking at <laughs> these two rather graphic figures on each side. It is hard to ignore. He looks happy to see us there. <laughs> But actually, those are supposed to scare away ghosts and stuff. You know, there's, there's stuff for the harvest, 
those rings are meant to protect things. I mean, there's a lot of meaning behind it. it looks yeah. pretty different than the Tibetan stuff, huh? Yeah, it's much rougher. Animism predates Tibetan Buddhism, and it's also tied to nature. Yunnan is one of China's leading tea producing regions because of its tropical climate and high altitude. It's over a thousand meters above sea level. The tea leaves grown here are made into over a hundred varieties of tea. Ah, Xinxiang, you are What are you up to? I'm Oh, so he's drying tea. Where is this tea from? This tea is from where? No, it's from that place. From old, old trees or big trees over there? Oh, cool. All right, cool. He's happy to show us his family's tea trees. Though people are collecting the tea here, legend has it that monkeys were trained to collect the leaves from wild tea trees growing on steep mountainsides. Not such a bad idea. So some of these tea trees have been around here for hundreds of years. Man, what a place oh. to have to cultivate them, too. This is it's a beautiful area. Ni bu hai pa. You're not scared? <laughs> so what kind of tea leaves do you look for when you pick them? Okay, so yeah. they, they like taking the new leaves better than the old leaves. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Nice. Do you also eat this? Mm. It, it actually, yeah, it tastes like, <laughs> tastes like tea. It's bitter. It does. It doesn't taste like tea right at first, but... It's the aftertaste that really. Yeah, oh, it's, yeah, yeah. it's like jasmine tea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How long have you been doing this kind of work? Oh, Jenda, 58 years. But the family has been farming tea for several generations. I wonder how many teacups you can actually get out of a full basket like that. Ten cups. Okay, ten cups. That's yeah. actually a lot less than I would have thought. That's a yeah. that's hard work then to get a full pot. Yeah. Well, I guess after all the processing and drying, I mean, it makes sense. Oh, how about? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, I'd love a cup of tea. Yeah. Right. We learn that in Buddhist temples, where monks follow strict dietary rules, drinking tea is one of their few pleasures. And I bet it also helps them stay awake while meditating. You know, it seems only right that after all the time we've spent in China and all the cups of tea we've had, we're finally getting it from the source. All I know is that after all the stuff that we went through in Gansu, just getting manhandled and basically kicked out of the province, it's nice to sit back here where it's beautiful weather and just chill and drink some tea. I mean, that's exactly what we need. I'll drink to that. We're heading from the tea plantation to meet back up with our friend, Yishi Zhe Wu, the Tibetan monk. At Mengle Cultural Park in southern Yunnan province, we have the rare opportunity to watch Theravada dancers while sitting with the Tibetan monk. We've seen a lot of the outward differences between these two types of Buddhism. But we ask Yi Shi Zhou Wu whether their philosophies are actually different. We learn that while both Tibetan and Theravadan Buddhists aim for an inner peace, or enlightenment, the Tibetans place particular emphasis on the altruistic aim to end suffering for all living beings. But differences aside, Yi Shi Zhou Wu seems to enjoy the dancers. Jeff, how cool is it that even though they're from two different parts of Buddhism, I mean, he's Tibetan Buddhist and they're Hinayana, that he's able to watch their rituals. And you can tell they're really getting into it, too, because they're not only you know, performing the rituals for him, but they're, they're all dressed up and everything. This has got to be such a different type of Buddhism to what he's accustomed to. Yeah, it's definitely different from what we saw in Shaha.
We crowd in closer for a better look as the festival reaches its finale. The lighting of prayer rockets. We return to the temple where Ishi Jo Wu is praying. We've learned a lot about the differences between two schools of Buddhism, but one question remains. What makes Tibetan Buddhism such a threat to the Chinese government, whereas in Shishuangbana, Hinayana Buddhism is not a threat, and in some ways it's actually kind of endorsed. You know, it's marketable. It's, it's great for tourism. I think one of the things that's kind of important to realize is that Tibetan Buddhism is contained within a, an individual culture, you know, an individual ethnic group. Also, too, in Tibetan Buddhism, you have a central leader. You have the Dalai Lama. You have living Buddhas. Whereas in Hinayana Buddhism, there's no kind of central power seat. And the Dalai Lama has also actively drawn international attention to the plight of Tibet. But from our perspective, the difference between the Buddhist schools isn't about politics. To first go to Gansu and see that kind of you know, Tibetan Buddhism and figure out what makes that Buddhism that kind of Buddhism. Um, and then you know, to come to Shishuangban and see how different it is here has been really pretty eye-opening. I think a big part of that is the environment. You know, I think the cool thing is at the end of the day, both Tibetan Buddhists and Hinayana Buddhists are aiming for the same thing. They just have slightly different ways of getting there. I guess that's the bottom line. It's all about the journey.